Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're having a lovely day. So today I am here live with Tommy Hickey. He is the head of the Repair Coalition. They are the group responsible for getting right to repair on the ballot in Massachusetts in 2020 and for it passing in an absolute landslide, 75 to 25. He had to go up against a lot of garbage from the automakers. They spent about $26 million creating those advertisements that I was showing you, implying that right to repair would have you assaulted in a parking lot, talking about uh, redlining, racism, burglary, and all this other stuff and they won against amazing odds so thank you so much for taking the time i really appreciate it thanks for having me lewis for those of us that have been less involved for the past two years can you talk a little bit about what this ballot initiative did that was not covered by the law that was done in 2012 for right to repair because a lot of people in my comments are saying i thought this passed a long time ago why does there have to be another right to repair for automobiles since we already got this in 2012 yeah. So, I mean, it goes back and this is how I got involved. I got involved in 2010 as one of the grassroots coordinators who would go out to all of the independent repair shops in Massachusetts, find out what was going on in the landscape firsthand and got us to the 2012 ballot. And the 2012 ballot question basically made sure that the OBD standard uh, diagnostic port, which is where independent repairs plug into vehicles to diagnose them, that it was standardized and they're all makes and models, meaning independent repairs would get the same information as dealerships. There was an MOU then signed after the Massachusetts law for 49 other states. And what happened in that law, that MOU was a, a, a provision in the law that took out wireless data and it's called telematics. 2013, 2012, telematics wasn't in a lot of vehicles. Today, it's in about 90% of vehicles. So manufacturers pulled the wool over our eyes, knowing they're moving to this wireless system, and we're going to be able to circumvent the 2012 law, which is why in 2020 we had to go update the law to include wireless technologies and telematics to make sure that independent repairs can go into this wireless world and have a competitive level playing field. And we tried to get them for years to come to the table, make an agreement. They did not. So we actually did have to go to the ballot. There has not been an MOU for the 2020 law, um, which, as you so so well described the uh, the issue uh, ahead of us. We are in federal court on that issue right now. Okay. Now a lot of people are saying, you know, this is if this is a federal issue, um, you know, this, this this doesn't seem like something to be outraged about because if federal law does preempt state law, and you seem particularly angry at what this assistant lead counsel for the NHTSA sent out. Can you explain why, as somebody who's been involved with this case now for over two years in court, why this was offensive and why this was aggravating from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's really frustrating because we passed this in November of 2020. It's 75%. So over 2 million people support this initiative. Um, and I know it, it goes bigger than Massachusetts, but in Massachusetts, we were the first in 2012. We we're the first in 2020. And we've since gone into a court case for years, two and a half years of discovery of experts, of car engineers, of manufacturers, all having a discussion, all kind of putting their two cents into this. And since the judge has said throughout the two and a half years, NHTSA, please come in, give us your expertise, let us know how you feel about this, and they stayed quiet. And now the judge is at the point where he wants no more discovery, he's going to make a decision on this case, and then NHTSA writes a letter not pointing to any case law, not getting involved in the specifics of, uh, of our bill, showing, by the way, no sign of passing right to repair, not having a, a, a further conversation about it, just kind of putting a knife in the heart of right to repair and saying it stops here. And it was really frustrating because they didn't have any conversations with us. Um, they did this, like I said, well after discovery, and it felt like it wasn't just a gut shot to our Massachusetts initiative, but right to repair as a whole. Yeah, the thing that I found really interesting is that they she didn't write this to the, the court. She wrote it to the car manufacturers. So it's almost as if to say, we are going to completely sidestep not just the legislative process, but also the judicial process and just pretend that you guys don't exist, which it really just seems kind of like more rule by monarchy than rule by three branches of government kind of thing. Yeah, it seems more like a manufacturer stall tactic. And they've been doing this for two and a half years of, of tying this up to make sure that it doesn't go into statute. They reached out to NHTSA, got them to write this letter, and then they can look at the court and say, hey, look, NHTSA's tying this up too. So it's frustrating. But we do feel like we're going to get through this. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. So 
I am happy to get on here and other outlets to uh, explain the issue and our frustrations with it. Okay, so trying to steel man the manufacturers and NHTSA's arguments, why would they say that this is unsafe? Because, again, they, they talk about remotely being able to unlock a vehicle, accelerating, braking, and things of that nature. Why are, the, why are those concerns ridiculous, and why are those concerns unwarranted, wrong, or not concerns that should be discussed when we're discussing being able to get access to wireless telematics and diagnostics for your vehicle? Yeah, well, first and foremost, they're already doing this, right? So car manufacturers are already collecting information. They're already sharing it with their dealerships in terms of how to fix a car wirelessly. So this whole notion that if an independent repair gets the same wireless data as a dealership, all of a sudden cybersecurity goes out the window is false in so many different ways. And I know the FTC and the Biden administration have already gone into this aspect of security through obscurity. And for some reason, they've made this cybersecurity argument about personal information getting leaked and whatnot. And it's really important. I've tried to really rub this into people's skin. This is about diagnostic and repair information. This is not about anything more, anything less. As I talked about earlier, an OBD port is how independent repairs and do it yourself is for getting into cars. They're plugging in a scan tool and they're diagnosing their car so they can make the proper repair. That is becoming wireless just as if headphones have become wireless from plugging into a jack. That is the only conversation, that is what we're after right now. So this whole aspect of cybersecurity and malicious hackers is something that the manufacturers made up into scaring people. And we know about that there in the campaign that they ran against us in 2020. Yeah, the thing that I find interesting is when they say that there are these many security risks for other people access it. Well, I mean, that shouldn't exist whether it's the dealer accessing it or an independent. If you've created a system that's this seriously insecure, you guys have to go back to the drawing board and fix this because I wouldn't even want the dealer to have access to that. Like, I right, would not I, want the dealer to be able to remotely unlock or start my car because I took it in for repair once. And if they can, we have a serious problem. Right. And we always say we're not. I think a lot of folks think that we're trying to put this technology in a vehicle. The manufacturers already have this. We're saying if there's now a new wireless, a new technology, we have to have access to it as car owners, not as independent repair shops. This is the car owner. You bought the car. You should have access to getting everything you need to, in order to fix it. Because at the end of the day, you have to pay for that repair. What's stopping you from finding, let's say, a congressman to sneak an amendment into a different bill rather than doing it, say, through a ballot initiative? We've tried to get this done federally. I mean, the federal government, for you know whatever it's worth, has not taken any initiative in order to get this passed. And so, which is why we've gone to the states. And I think the idea is we've done it in Massachusetts. We do feel like we're going to be upheld. We do have another ballot initiative pending in Maine, which will go before uh, voters in November. And we'll take it to as many states as we have to until the federal government can can get their act together or the manufacturers finally wake up and, and decide to make a deal. But we would love to see this get done federally. It just hasn't. And it's been a long time coming and making sure that, that folks, even if we can do it at the state level and begin that momentum, is really important. Now, when you look at this, and it's a letter that was written where they're talking about, you know, the ability to send, uh, remotely send commands, allowing for manipulation of a vehicle, like safety critical functions, like steering, acceleration, and braking. Are, is this just completely made up, or are they actually implying that the manufacturers designed the system in such an insecure way that if you have access to the diagnostic section of the machine, that you can then control the vehicle's steering? Like, yeah, I don't know why that would ever be allowed. Uh, I mean, listen, car manufacturers send this to dealers. Dealers are already remotely diagnosing vehicles. So there's no safety concerns when that happens. And all of a sudden, an independent repair gets diagnostic information wirelessly. And before you know it, we're controlling people's steering. So, I mean, it's, it's just really weird to imagine that if there's a dealer out there that really, really doesn't like my YouTube videos and I take my car in for service, that he can make it look like I was driving drunk on a Friday night and just went off the road and, and like, you know, CIA'd me or something. It's like, that's what's being implied here. My, I guess my, my real question is, do any of these citations stand up to actual scrutiny? Because in this document, the ability to send commands, citation four, and they, 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 are, they are actually citing documents here for every one of these claims. Have you gone through the citations here, like Mass Gen Laws 93K, the new attack vectors that could be potentially remotely exploited or any of this? Like, would this actually stand up to scrutiny or is this purely a stall tactic? Could this actually be, like, if this argument were reviewed in court over the past two years, would this have been laughed out of the court? Well, I have a feeling that they didn't bring this to the courts when we were doing discovery uh, because they didn't feel confident about it. I will tell you that Mass 93K is our law. 
So that's our statute that was created when we passed the 2020 ballot. I can't tell you how car manufacturers design their cars, but I can tell you that there are banks, there are ISO standards, there are all kinds of very, very protective industries that have information that is very personal, like banks, that are able to give information to third parties and every second of the day and are able to protect it from other aspects of the banking company you're not supposed to get into. So I, I think about PayPal, I think about Venmo, I think about Santander, online banking, Bank of America, all of these entities that are able to safely give information to third parties but protect the rest of the information. So to say that car manufacturers all of a sudden can't do it but also can give it to dealers in a safe and secure way, I would say there's no merits to that argument. Yeah, I mean, the same way that you can log in, I can log into my account at Chase, but I can't log into yours and wire myself money. When the dealer is doing a diagnostic on a car, he doesn't have the ability on a Ford Mach-E to change the PID loop so that the car has a zero to 60 in one second and the wheels blow off of it. You know, these, so these things are segmented. So the idea that they simply cannot be segmented and that it's either all or nothing access either seems to me to be A, have zero knowledge whatsoever with what's going on or B, purposely misleading people. Uh, now, the, the, speaking of purposely misleading people, uh, the, the connection there that many have noticed, which is that the legal aid, or head of the assistant legal aid here that sent this letter, happened to work at the law firm that just so happens to be handling the case against you in right to repair, is a connection that many have noticed and is really, really hard to ignore. But to make the type of claim that this is happening because there's some sort of direct connection with somebody who hasn't worked at that law firm now for about 11 years, there are some people that would say that that is conspiratorial thinking and that, no, this is purely happens to be a coincidence that the person who sent this letter, hi up at NHTSA, is parroting the BS of the car manufacturers. What would you say to somebody who looks at that and says, this is conspiratorial thinking during a time where people are starting to get tired of conspiratorial thinking? I think people should form their own conclusions. Uh, looking at this, as you said, those are simple facts that are laid out. I do find it very frustrating that we could not get in to see NHTSA before they would issue such a outright attack on our ballot initiative. But I would let folks come to their own conclusions on that. There is a, a, a wild coincidence there. I've definitely come to mind, but I was just kind of curious what, what your thoughts on that are. Uh, the most important question here is, I mean, the question that keeps showing up is, okay, I really appreciate that you've given us all this information. I appreciate that you've made this ballot initiative available in the state of Massachusetts for 75% of the people to vote yes on. What now? Normal people want to know. You know, I'm mad at my screen and I'm mad at NHTSA and I'm mad at the people who did this. What, what, what does the average everyday person do? So, How can they help you? I mean I mean, first and foremost, if you're in another state, right, you should be calling your local official, whether it's a state rep, a senator, a congressperson, it doesn't matter, down the line, Department of Transportation, Energy Commerce, I mean, any elected official that can get something like right to repair done in your state or in your country or wherever you are, I think you have the right to call them and say, we now are under attack as a, as, as a, as a generation of car owners. We now need access to this before we lose our car repair choice. If you're a resident of Massachusetts, our attorney general has enforced the law on June 1st. So if you are driving in a 2022 car or your independent repair has been shut out of some information necessary to make a full repair, you're liable for damages if you go to your attorney general. And if you're a Massachusetts driver that doesn't have that, you know you're about to get a new car. You know eventually down the road you'll be getting a new car. You should be calling your congressman, you should be calling your state rep and state senator and saying, we need to bring this NHTSA to task on this. You cannot be sending letters involving a court case talking about federal preemption when you have no grounds to do so. And so I think if, I, if, if I'm a Massachusetts consumer and, and I voted for this, I'm angry and I'm calling whoever will listen to me about it. Yeah, I, th I think that people calling their what, their local House and Senate representatives and telling them NHTSA really does need to be reined in on this. If you're going to make these types of comments, do it in a court. Don't just speak with the car manufacturers directly and pretend that the judge and the legislative process don't exist is really important here because this isn't even necessarily about federal preemption. This is not, And this is not even about cars, I would say. It's about whether or not an unelected bureaucrat can override the judicial branch and the legislative branch in the state and at the federal level, which I think is an abuse of power that is going to snowball in a very poor way, if not handled at this point. Well, the, thank you very much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Anything that I did not touch on that you would like people to know? No, I think, uh, I think you did a great job, uh, as always, uh, in articulating our, our position, our frustration. 
and we really will see this through. Thank you so much for taking the time, and thank you so much for ensuring that in a world where everything has become a subscription and unrepairable, that people have the ability to choose who fixes their car. I'm sure there are a lot of people watching this channel that really appreciate the work you do, and in Massachusetts, hopefully, that they, they voted yes on this in 2020. Thanks, Lewis. All right, bye.